Okay, good morning everyone. Yeah. So continuously from the last week. So today we are I, I'm going to present this mechanical property of certain materials. So So yeah, for getting your memory from the last week. So we we, we try to understand how you analyze some stiffness from the instrument. So actually, so many people, they measure some, not many people, some people, they measure the tissue stiffness from the blood, brain, muscle, and bone. And then they find out, depending on the, this uh, stiffness, when, when stem cell are culture on the same stiffness, they differentiate into the target tissue. So in soft tissue, they can differentiate into neuron, and then in hard tissue, in hard stiffness, the stem cell can differentiate into the bone-like cell. So this is a very basic binding. So if you want to make some kind of target biomaterial, yeah, please consider their stiffness of the target tissue. And then but, this stiffness, they cannot control the stem cell fate in 3D. Because in 3D, uh, when you vary the stiffness, but if the cell cannot spread out, the cell cannot differentiate into your target tissue. So that's why, this, uh, even though this MSC culture on osteogenic and adipogenic mixed media, they only can differentiate into the adipocyte even under high stiffness. But this stem cell can be activated by ROX3. ROX3 is some kind of stem cell force enhancer. So in that case, the stem cell can differentiate in this uh, mixed media. So in this article, uh, when you refer this in the article, they said that when cell can start to spread out, the cell can differentiate into their target tissue in this paper in osteogenic. So you have to understand 2D and 3D is totally different. In 2D, more stiffness, more bone, less, less stiffness, soft tissue, more brain, more neuron, like more liver. But in this 3D condition, anyhow, they, they have to spread out for getting some force. Okay, so this is very totally different two conditions, so you should understand this one. So for enlarging their understanding, they did this kind of experiment. So when you consider your tissue, adipose, liver, brain, or bone, even bone and collagen gel, they have some, they, they are stress relaxed but when your hydrogen or your material are covalent cross-linking, there is no stress relaxation, which means they always resist. In that case, the cell cannot spread out, and it, the, the cell cannot adjust their extracellular matrix, and then maybe this is not good for cell. So anyhow, in this paper, they are using arginate, and they vary the molecular weight of arginate from the high and low, and even they add TEG as a spacer, and then they can vary their stress relaxation depending on their molecular weight, and then PG addition. So they find out one, two, three, four different stress relaxed arginate gel, and then which was labeled by half of tau. Do you know the, can you remember the meaning? When you normalize the initial stress as one, and then how much of time does it take to get 50% of initial stress? So when you draw this line here, this is the stress relaxation time. So a soft plus PG, soft, intermediate, high. So you can refer this half of tau time, and then they maintain the initial elastic modulus, uh, one day, seven day, even, 
and then when they measure the dry mass, similar. So in this paper, they only change their stress relaxation time and then maintain every other parameter of hydrogel. And then they find out this more stress relax gel is good for stem cell differentiation at the moment. And then uh, when you measure this uh, stress relaxation, as you remember, we can use some gel disc, 15 millimeter diameter and 2 millimeter thickness. And then uh, they use instrum. So within 50% compression, which means that 2 millimeter thickness can be compressed 15%. And then they maintain. During the time, during their maintenance, they measure the, their stress. And they, they check over time, some gel are no stress relaxed like this, but some gel are stress relaxed like biomimetic tissue. So we are using this concept uh, and then measure their stress relaxation by our hand. So th actually this uh, assay is performed by G1. So G1 make So Geo make this kind of uh, soft, intermediate, and hard gel, and then they check stiffness. You can see uh, from this strain stress curve, you can you can see some their different stiffness. Okay, different stiffness, and then from this um, slope of this strain stress curve, you can measure their elastic modulus. Sometimes this PPT doesn't work. My gosh. Duplicate screen. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, from this strain stress strain stress curve, you can measure the stiffness from the slope. So this is low stiffness, middle stiffness, high stiffness. So you can vary the stiffness. And then when you want to measure the stress relaxation time. So at this point, around 30 seconds, so which means that we compress the gel 15% and then maintain their height of instrum. And then over time, you can measure their stress. And then you can see all kind of gel, they are stress relaxed. And then when you want to measure stress relaxation time at half of tau, which means that this initial stress can be relaxed to 50%, so you can see this line. So from this point to this point, this is some time of the stress relaxation. So hard is around 30 seconds and intermediate and soft is around 15 or 40 seconds. So not much of difference compared to this. Yeah, this paper, yeah, they measure the stress relaxation time. So around 100 seconds, they can say this is good for cell, but we are making this very, very fast sex relaxation gel. So we can expect 
This gel is anyhow good for cell. So, and then or when you want to measure the stress relaxation of gel or stiffness, you can use instrument in dental building, room 517. And then you have to use very low load cell. So actually, load, or what is the meaning of load cell? So in the instrument, the load cell can measure the stress. So depending on the load cell type, so we, we can vary. Like 10 Newton, we have. 100 Newton, we have. 1K Newton. 10K Newton. So depending on your, your sample, we have to change their load cell. Because using the high value of the load cell, like 10K Newton, when you measure, measure the hydrogen, even though they can measure something, but we cannot believe this. So that's why you have to optimize which kind of low cell can be used. So for hydrogen, we have, you have to use one, 10 Newton low cell, 10 Newton which means that one kilogram, right? So very, so when this low cell can over the one kilogram, they break, they are broken. So how much is it? 6K dollar. Very expensive. Yeah, so here we have Mr. An. So maybe he is in charge of the instrument. So if you have one, if you want to measure this hydrogel using the instrument, maybe please contact him. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah Mr. An. Thank you always. Anyhow, you have to remember if, when you use this instrument, Using 10 Newton load cell, you have to very be you have to be very careful. Okay, this 6k dollar. Okay, and then how you can make this gel to measure? So normally, uh, like this uh, gel can be made this PDMS mold. So after PDMS mixing, so you can uh, pour this PDMS on certain dish, and then you can punch. So you can punch two times, like let's say 20 millimeter outer punch, and then your inner side should be around 12 millimeter. So if you punch two times, 20 millimeter, and then 12, 20 millimeter, and 12 millimeter, and you can make this kind of uh, PDMS mold, like round shape. And then you, if you can make, you pour your hydrogel, like Germa or other kind of silk collagen gel, or other alginate, you can make this type of hydrogen. So as you can expect, this thickness is around 2 millimeter, and then this uh, diameter is around 12 millimeter. So we can, using this PDMS mold, to make the, your specimen of hydrogel, and then you can make it. And then you can measure their stiff, stiffness and stress relaxation time. Okay. Let's refer this video for enhancing your understanding. When you want to measure their uh, stiffness, maybe you can go on this gel to break it. But if you want to measure the, their stress relaxation time, like let's say this is 15% compression, and you, st you can stop the machine. And then during that time, you can measure how this gel induces some stress from this compression mode. And then uh, on time, the Low cell in, in up the top point, they have low cell. Low cell can measure how much of stress is induced by hydrogen when we compress 15%. Okay, so and then um, you can also uh, beyond the hydrogen, you can also measure their strength of membrane or nanofiber. So like this one, when you can make this kind of rectangular shape of membrane or, or nanofiber, you can measure how much this fiber resists 
from the outer force. Okay? So let's refer this U2. You can see the little little height is enlarged. We have very small, very low speed, and then they start to break down. Okay? So once you make your membrane or nanofiber, anyhow, you have to measure their stiffness. As you can expect, depending on your stiffness or material, you can expect this material is good for the osteoblast or good for the neuron or good for the, good for the liver. So that's why we need, we need to measure the stiffness or membrane or nanofiber. And then how you make it? Anyhow, if you electrospun your fiber, you can make this 60, 10, and this is the diameter of height and width, and then this 0.5 is some thickness, okay? And then sometimes, so you can vary this uh, height and width, and then thickness. Okay, and let's refer this video. So we are making this uh, kaitosan based membrane. So we can find out that this very high strength from the they can resist from the very high strength. Okay. So anyhow, you, we can make this kind of membrane. And then when you measure this. A mem membrane or nanofiber strength, or uh, this machine can only measure their stress. Okay, stress means that as a newton, first power, and then you have to consider their area. So when you make this kind of 60, 10, uh, 0.5 millimeter of membrane or nanofiber, what is what is the area of the injected? So this is the area. Okay, 10 multiply 0.5 millimeter oh, because you have to only consider when you cut this like this horizontally there is some one surface this surface is 10 and 0.5 millimeter area okay so as you know always when you want to measure the stress you have to consider how much of strength as a newton was applied and then what is the area so this is the area of, the, of this specimen. And then when you think about this 40 is height and 10 is width and 0 0.04 is millimeter is the thickness and then the area is like this. So by yourself, you have to uh, put this value in this instrument machine and then in properly and then only you can properly measure their stress so uh, for getting this kind of uh, strength or stiffness of your nanofiber or membrane you can use two different instruments one is in pharmacy our this building fourth floor and then one is data school so if you want to measure very uh, low value of the strength If we want to measure very low value, and then you have to use in dental instrument, but if we want to measure very high value, you can use in fourth floor instrument. This instrument is next to the FASM machine. So uh, from this uh, kind of nanofiber or membrane strengths, we can publish in many good journals. So this year, Dr. Kapil published in CNT coated nanofiber and then you can refer this uh, material method maybe you can understand now tensile mechanical properties what is the meaning of tensile? tensile means then they are stretched okay and then electrospun PCL and CNT coated PCL nanofiber analyze using instrument okay you have to 
always you have to mention about what is the load cell maximum value. And in, the, in this time, Kapil used 500 Newton. Okay? As described. And then the sample size is 60 length, 10 width, 0.5 thickness. And then gauge length is 14 millimeter. Always we have to make it a little bigger, like 60. And then gauge means that uh, even though this total membrane is 60, but you can catch it, this membrane as a 40, as an initial width. And from that point, you can stretch it out. And then speed is 10 millimeter per minute. I'll explain later. And anyhow, always you have to write down the speed of the instrument because depending on the speed, the strength can vary. Okay. So if, if we want to highlight, you want to make some high strength membrane, when you increase the speed, you can get a high value. But when you decrease the speed, you can get a low value. So you can little trick the strength depending on the speed. So that's why people and reviewers, they always want to mention about the speed speed of the instrument. And then stress strain curve were recorded. And then based on this, the parameter will calculate elastic modulus, you can remember, tensile strength, yield point, elongation, and energy dissipation. Let's see the results. So this is some basic strain and stress curve as a real data. And then, as you know, this strain, there is no value because depending on their initial length, we can vary. So, like I said, 0.3 means that they said 50 millimeter, 40 millimeter length. So, why do you mean the 0.3? They, they stretch around 12 millimeters. Okay? So, when they stretch around uh, 16 millimeter, they start to break down. So, without CNT coating, they break down, but after CNT coating, they are a little, little bit resist further, like this 0.6 tangent and strain, and then they break down. So we can expect that, and from this strain stress curve, maybe what is the tangent strength at maximum? This is some value of this one, right? And then CNT, when decorated, a little bit less. So based on the CNT coated, you can expect a little bit less tangent strength. And what is the yield strength? Yield strength is not the maximum. Some, some kind of this point uh, fr from the initial linear and then when they curvature to the some curve, you can measure this around this range is yield strength. So this CNT without CNT is around this value. But after coating is also around this. Actually, just so you cannot perfectly measure the yield strength, but as a theoretically, when this curve is linear, and then when they start to show some curve, you can point out this is around the yield strength. Yield strength means that they start to show some permanent change of the strength. If you even when you relax this membrane, okay. What, how you measure the elastic modulus? From this slope, you can measure the elastic modulus, but so depending on where you measure the slope, you can change the vary. You can measure the different elastic modulus. For example, so <laughs> if you measure this slope, this is some, you can say initial elastic modulus, but also this can be the elastic modulus. Right? So, it may be in this, uh, some people, they want to mention where you measure the elastic modulus. So, many people, they mention like from the 0 to 5% of strain or 5 to 10% strain, I measure the, their elastic modulus. Anyhow, maybe Hapil, they he measure around this area. Maybe within 5%, they measure like this. And then, Strain and failure means that how much they're stressed. Okay? So this value is a strain and failure of CNT. 
and this value, like this, is their strain and failure. So, the strain and failure and the strain yield can be measured using this point. Okay, strain and failure is the how much of x axis, and the strain yield is. Ah, certain yield is around this, yeah, where they start to deform. So maybe this value, around this value, is a certain yield. And why is the dissipation energy? This is a kind of toughness. Toughness means that total energy, how they observe before they break down. So this area is the dissipation energy. So as you can expect, this when the sand is coated, there is more area. So we can highlight dissipated energy is more high. So we can say that what is the effect of the sand coating on PCI fiber? So there is not much of change of tensile strength, and the elastic modulus is a little bit decreased, and the strain failure, uh, as I can see, is increased in here. And then dissipation energy is increased. So we can say that this is more, we can make more soft material, and then they observe more energy. Yeah, like that. So, yeah, this kind of thing. So even though you, when you can measure just one stress and strain curve, you can get a lot of data. And then from this data, we can expect that this can be used for bone. Why this can be used for neuron. Okay. And then, yeah, this is another example. So let's check their uh, material method. So we are this material, also, this is another uh, polyurethane based fiber from the electro spawn. So we, we, using this electro spinning methodology, we can make electro spawn fiber using polyurethane. And then this material has 40 and 10 millimeter rectangular shape. And then thickness is 0 0.04. And then speed, always mentioned. And then until the sample broke. Okay, N number six. And then this uh, ten tension loads are applied to each specimen at a constant strain of 100% with a deformation rate of 600 seconds. And then this is for checking the stress relaxation. So which means that we stretched out 100% double the height. So which means that the original height is 40, then we make it a four, uh, eight, 80 millimeter. And then uh, during the 600 second, we measure how their stress is relaxed. Okay. And then the corresponding stress was recorded along with the time. And then time for initial stress for material to relax to half its value. The relaxation was also determined. So this is the meaning of the stress relaxation. But this is a real result. So stress strain curve. Yeah. So from this one, we for once we measure, we can measure their top maximum tensile stress, high, low. So without Nanographic oxide, uh, very low stiffness, a uh, low stress. But when you incorporate more, we can see more higher tensile stress, which means that they can resist more. And then elastic modulus, high, right? This slope is higher than without NGO. And then, yeah, proportional limit. Proportional limit is that when they start to sh show curve. So around this area, okay, for the red one, around this area is the proportional limit. And then maybe this black one around very here. They start to show curve. So this is a proportional limit as a strain. And then this is some uh, after this graph, you can only change this strain to the time. On the same time you can measure. And then we can 
say that this initial stress is down to 50% and then this is a time of sex relaxation of each specimen. And this was calculated and then plot like here. So uh, on the same time, you can measure the, this, this thing and then this sex relaxation. But when you want to make it break it down, so you have to make different samples. One is for this uh, tensile stress strain curve, and then this stress relaxation time, you have to make, you have to use another sample. Because only for this stress relaxation, you cannot break down the sample. You have to maintain their structure. So maybe this n number is six, n number six, you have you need 12 samples. Six for stress strain curve and six for stress relaxation. So I strongly recommend you guys always have to measure this strain strain curve and stress relaxation time together. Okay. Yeah, and then yeah, this is some fiber we make it to measure this stiffness and sex relaxation. And then also uh, if you if you made this 3D scaffold, also you can measure their stress strain curve. So this is some journal in science and medicine. So this uh, stress stiffness stress stiffness and stress relaxation um, you can measure this thing and then you can publish your data in very good journal, okay? So you should not ignore this sex relaxation or stress parameter. So they make super uh, flexible uh, this kind of 3D scaffold. So as you know, strain stress curve, okay? So once, yeah, so you, you can, and you can understand now, and then they continuously on um, multiple time, first and second time, they measure stress test curve, and then they found out they are maintained. There, this kind of last, uh, this kind of curve they are maintained. They find out how they measure. They 3D printed this 3D scaffold, and then once they apply the compress, and then when they release it, you can see this 3D scaffold. They are maintained their structure. So, and then they plot like this, um, strain, stress. So this load, when you divide it by area, that can be converted to stress. And now in here, they shown as a load Newton. So once they apply the compression mode, and then they even further, they break down, and then they, anyhow, until here, they maintain this strain. And then in here they find out cyclic axial compression loading, which means that they compress and release at very several times. So first time, second time, and ten times. Even ten times they maintain their compression stress like this. Okay? For getting this data, they only compress at 25%. Maybe they compress 100%, this can be break, break down. But uh, when you want to measure the, these cyclic things, you have to determine the, how much of strain is applied. So when you look at this paper, they also mention uh, they make this 3D printed scaffold, diameter and length, 90 layers, and then blah, blah, blah. And then loads and constant displacement rated 50 millimeter per minute, okay? They, you should always write down the speed and at 40% compression strain each cycle for total 20 cycle, okay? So if you make this kind of very uh, elastic, so this is exactly the meaning of the elastic. Once you compress and then relax the stress, they maintain their total length. This is the meaning of the elastic. But uh, so in this paper, they find out they made this kind of super elastic 3D scaffold as a 3D printed manner. 
And then once you want to make 3D scaffold and to measure this straight, straight stretch curve, very important thing is that you always have to make very similar 3D scaffold because this is some same specimen 3D scaffold, but depending on the porosity, at the porosity you can make it your own intention, or sometimes this porosity can occur without your intention. So more porosity means that there is more um, um, more porosity, less strength. Even this original original uh, less strength is around 200, but when you malformed this 3D scaffold, which has 50% of porosity, and then their original value is down to 25%, around 50. Okay. So this is the why when you want to make the 3D scaffold. There is, there is no pore if we want to measure their original strength. But uh, unfortunately, depending on the researcher, they can make different porosity 3D scaffold and then they can vary a lot. So you have to always remember how you homogeneously make the scaffold as a prototype. So, and then this is um, one of the examples of the cycling. So, compressed and relaxed. And then sometimes, so actually, when you refer this kind of things, so you can also vary their cycling type, like maintain continuously, stop, and maintain, stop. Or also, you can increase their strength, or up and down, up and up and down, or this sinusoidal strength can be applied. So depending on your intention, you can vary this cycling assay. So in bottom line, so when you once you want to measure their hydrogel or 3D scaffold or nanofiber membrane, anyhow, you always have to remember the write down in material method, the machine name, which kind of instrument you use. For example, like this, where is it? Yeah, instrument 5525 five or instrument 3000 something. And then size of specimen and low cell type, you 10 Newton, 100, 1K, 10K Newton, and speed, and then up to how much of percentage you apply for getting some stress relaxation or other things. And then how you calculate the stiffness. So in here, they mention first 5 to 10% of strain, they measure the slope, which means that the, how they measure the stiffness. Okay. So, and then for the hydrogel, yeah. Yeah, they mention like this. And then for nanofiber or so, maybe like this. So anyhow, if you make any kind of material, and then you when you you always have to measure this value and then write down in material method like this. And then another tip. So once if you want to make more higher strength, and then when you make it at a small size, you can get more strength. Yeah, this is another tip. So this is very theoretically. So, for example, if you can make bigger things, big, uh, in the, when you make some same material, make it bigger, there is more chance to have poor defect without your intention. In that case, you can get very low strength. But if you if you make the sample at a smaller size, they have less chance to have defect. So they can get more high strength. So this is a one tip. So uh, from now on and uh, from this moment, you have to understand the, what is the uh, stress strain curve and then how you measure the stiffness, elastic modulus, and then strain a failure or stress relaxation. Any kind of, now you can understand any kind of things can be understandable. And then 
once, if we want to measure the surface strength, actually the bulk strength and the surface strength is totally different. So, for example, so for getting this hardness, hardness what is the meaning? Surface mechanical property. So what is the most higher strength, higher hardness material? Diamond. Diamonds never break down. And actually, they can break down using high uh, bulk strength, bulk stress, but you cannot scratch the diamond by your finger or any kind of things. Only diamond can stretch, make scratch to other side. Okay. So that is why for measuring the hardness, we are using the diamond. So this is a hardness, hardness measuring machine, which is located in the fourth floor of this building. And then depending on their diamond type, as a, this spherical and this kind of things, and this yeah, rectangular, and then this shape, they named. This is a Brinell hardness machine, Rockwell, Picos, and Loop hardness machine. So their mechanism like once this diamond is entered, they push it on the surface and then they make this kind of scratch and then pull out. And then depending on how much how much of length or how much of height was made by this diamond, you can measure the strength of this surface. Okay? So I will show you one example. So when you measure this uh, hardness, they, they always look at the surface area. So this is some, not a diamond at, at the moment, this is some microscope. After measuring the microscope, and then this is the machine to push up, so you can see this is a diamond. So once they approach, this could go down, and then certain, at certain minute, they go up, Mm. And during that time, also they can measure their surface stiffness, and then they change to the, this microscope. They can measure yeah, how much of area was defected, like this. Okay, so from this, oh sorry. So from this defect, you can measure the length axis and y-axis. So from this axis to y-axis, when you write down this axis to y-axis to certain program, they can calculate the hardness. So the hardness value is different to the strength. So the most uh, common methodology to measure the hardness is because hardness for material. Because it's good for the um, hard material. So maybe most of the people, they use the Picos hardness machine. So that's why we bought Picos hardness machine in our iTrend. So yeah, this is the, how they calculate the hardness. So once you, this is very, looks very complicated, but anyhow, they only measure this kind of, how much of defect was made by this diamond. So this D and H, or this height, and this diameter, and A and B, and then, the, and then this kind of the all value, when they apply in this formula, you can get the hardness. But as you know, this is not the Newton or any kind of metal Pascal. They showed like this RHN, HV, and KHN. We cannot convert this thing to the, our normal Newton or metal Pascal. They have their own value. As hardness, okay. So anyhow, we are most of the time we are using this because or noob. So we 
in, uh, in, our, in our right thread, we only have this because hardness machine. Okay? So, for example, if we want to make, if you can, if you make your biomaterial, you can measure bulk strength using instrument. And secondly, also you can measure this hardness. So, when you think about the cell point of view, when the cell can approach the biomaterial, what is the initial point when they, con when they interact? They always interact their surface of the biomaterial. So that is why sometimes uh, the hardness is very important. Yeah. From the point of the cell, cell never can detect the bulk stiffness or bulk of the strength. The cell only can uh, contact the surface of the material. So that's why hardness is sometimes very important. And then when you check this hardness, also you can get the value of the stiffness. So yeah, this is an example. So we measure this because hardness machine. And then always when you measure the hardness, you have to write down how much of force was applied. As you can expect, more force can make more defect. And then, how much of time you apply? Yeah. So these two parameters always should be mentioned in material method. Okay. So like this, uh, depending on how much of you incorporate certain nanoparticle in polymer, you can see more because hardness was obtained. Okay. So as I said before, uh, this hardness machine, unfortunately, we can only measure the hardness. But sometimes another machine named nano indenter, they can measure hardness, stiffness, and roughness, and also images all together. So this is in the our link center. So once you make your your any biomaterial, you can get this four value at the same time when you use nano indenter. But this price is like a little bit expensive. How about size? Do you know the size? So size, size of what? For checking the nano indenter? Any size is okay. Yeah, this is nano. So anyhow, uh, okay, I will show you this example. So maybe uh, this is our titanium disc. So there, maybe anyhow, the specimen should be flat. That is better because when they are a little bit change, a little bit angled, maybe it's not easy to detect. But anyhow, they can measure. But so flat surface is okay, and then the size doesn't matter. Any size they can detect. But anyhow, that should be stand on the surface, not floating. So this is how they apply. So they load this apply like 2,000 micronewton, and then loading five seconds, and, and loading five seconds, holding two seconds, unloading five seconds. Okay? So you can imagine the diamond, they apply five seconds. When, when, once they approach the surface, five seconds, they, pu they push, and then holding two seconds and on holding five seconds. And then from this point, when you measure, you can get this kind of images. So from these images, maybe in the center area, you can make the punch using a nano emitter. But this is before the nano emitter. So now in the machine, you can measure this roughness value, product area like this, and then mean height, max height, minimal height, peak to value. Peak to value means then, how much of up and down, okay? Up and down, and then like this, you can measure. And then, yeah, this is the concept of the, the hardness. So load, and then you can measure their displacement, okay? So from this displacement, you can gather contact depth, how much of depth, depth was detected, and contact stiffness. From this graph, you can, this is another 
strain stress curve, right? So that's why from this slope, they can measure the stiffness and then max force. During the, this approach, how much of force was obtained? Max force, max depth, contact area, and drift rate. So this kind of all things, this, so this is a stiffness and then hardness also you can get from this machine. But this machine, they can get the hardness as a gigapascal, not the because hardness value. Yeah. So I strongly recommend this using this machine to measure the surface strength characteristic. So you can measure stiffness and strength and hardness all together, and even images. Very good machine. And then, but uh, I try to measure this uh, nano indenter only from the hard material. So if you want to measure some soft material like hydrogel or some normal tissue, maybe you can privately contact with this operator. Maybe she is a very good person, so maybe she will guide you in a good way. Yeah. So this is not AFM-based, AFM-based? Not AFM-based. But generally, you need AFM-based. Hmm? For soft material? Soft material, yeah. Soft material, you can use the AFM. But maybe this material also, this uh, machine, I I found some paper they are using the nano inventor to measure the hydrogel stiffness also sometimes, but more suitable for hard material. So uh, for the AFM, maybe other time, Dr. Joe will educate you guys. Yeah. So yeah, and then so th I, I want to show what kind of strength test method you have depending on the how you apply the force you can measure very dynamically so you, you can understand tensile mode tensile is stretch compression mode compress and fracture mode actually sometimes it's not easy to measure the tensile or compression so that's why uh, from uh, this compression mode is sometimes used for measuring the strength of your material. I will show you later. And then as a type, bias shear 3.4 point is a subtype of the pressure mode, the shear mode, and impact test. This is an example of a four point flexure strength. Because sometimes specimen, they cannot compress easily. Or if we want to change, if we want to see some change, a difference among the sample, maybe compression mode sometimes is not easy to show their difference. In that case, you can make this kind of uh, rectangular disk and then apply in four point flexure test. This is some three point, one, two, three. This is a four point, one, two, three, four. Now this is supporting, this is applied. Supporting, applied. And then once you make the specimen a disc, and then also you can apply the force like this, using this link. This is an example of biaxial. Biaxial means that one axial, two axial, biaxial. So, uh, in, so in dental material, uh, we always use this uh, rectangular specimen and then measure their strength using this fracture mode. So the so meaning of the fracture is that this specimen, they can be flexed, uh, they can be curved easily. So when you imagine this specimen, when they compress using this uh, compact supporting area, maybe Sometimes the value is very high, and then it's not easy to make some difference among the groups. So that's why this compression, this using they are using compression mode, but using this uh, very specific supporting pins, you can measure the fracture strength. 
Okay, so when you want to make pressure stress uh, using the biaxial mode, you apply this curvature. This is a specimen, and you apply this force, and then supporting it around here. And it's very complicated. But anyhow, we have we have software. So once the software, they you click this biaxial mode, they automatically analyze. Once you add this A and this specimen diameter and then diameter of the applied things. Once you applied all this kind of parameter and then they automatically determine the value. So yeah, this is why we call it fracture mode. Yeah, this, once this, for example, your stick, let's imagine the stick. Yeah, this stick is compressed from the top. Uh, you can imagine the upper part, they are compressed. Because, and then this lower part, they are tangent. So only you have to remember that when you measure the, ten, the strength using the tangent or compression on the same scaffold, what, uh, what can be the high value? So com com always tangent, they show less value. Compression, always they show high value, even though you are using the same, same material, okay? So that is why uh, during the flexion mode, this, mo this material, they are compressed and they are tangent all together, but always the fracture can start from this bottom part. So you, when you can imagine when you want to measure the tangent strength of the glass, you have to grip it, right? But how you can grip the glass? Once you uh, grip the glass, sometimes the glass is fractured. So which means that you cannot measure the tangent strength from the glass material, okay? In that case, how you measure the tangent? So this is the indirect way to measure the tangent. Oh, because always from this uh, comp uh, compression, even this is a compression mode, but when you use these two different point supporting and then compress like this, this glass is start to break down from the tangent strength. Okay. So this is a merit of the fracture strength. From the compression mode, you can indirectly measure tangent strength. Yeah. So this is some applied force when you using one, two, three point they always force is highly in the center area. So maybe this center area, this bottom part, they break down. But this, when you apply four point, uh, this, is, uh, this strength is uh, continuously homogeneously in this area. So any time, any point, they can be break down, okay? So once you want to measure the fracture strength, same material, three point and four point. Can you imagine which method have higher value? The answer is three point. Yeah, because four point machine, they can break down anyway. So always the material they have some defect. So from the proportional a calculation, what well, they have many chance to have defect using this four point in this area. But when you think about this three point, when the when there's no defect in here, they can get high value. But in four point, any defect, once one defect is around here, they start to break down. So three point, they always show higher value. So there is why, and then and then when you look at this formula, always they minus L, okay? So even though they are almost similar, B, H, and P, L, so they minus L, so that is why they have a lower value always. And then also you can directly measure the tangent as a diameter tangent test. 
This is called Ganjal injunction. Okay? So when you think about the glass, you cannot grip it properly. So in that case, from this diameter tensile test, you can measure the tensile strength. Okay? So yeah, as I said, alignment or gripping problems in bridge material. So in that test methodology to determine the tensile strength. So you compress this by this material, and then once they break down, you can get the value of the maximum power, apply it, and then pi d t, and then you can get the data. Okay, I will show you. So once you make the specimen as a round, round shape, you can gather the di uh, this diameter tensile test. Okay. So depending on your specimen morphology, sometimes you can get this diameter tensile test. So oh, so and then. You can also, when you can make some very sticky material, and then you want to know what is the bond strength. Bond strength, as you can expect, uh, bond strength can be measured tensile bond or shear bond. What is the tensile bond? This is tensile bond. Okay. Once you stick together, and then you using tensile mode, you can get the bond stress. So this is tensile bond strength. But what is the shear bond stress? like this. This is the wall and then you apply the material and then this is the bond, bonding material and then when you apply this force they feel shear. Shear means perpendicular manner. The applied area and then I mean, not perpendicular, yeah, horizontal manner. Applied area and then applied force. This is shear and then you can sometimes you can call it pure shear because this is a bonding area, pull shear and push shear. Okay. So, yeah, this, so anyhow, this strain, stress, strain stress curve, also you can get how much of the bond strength from tensile or the, from the shear. Okay. So until this, we can use one machine, instrument. Universal testing machine, and then you can measure very dynamics, very different strengths, bond strengths, compression strengths, tensile strengths, and then even hydrogel and 3D scaffold. Or so from this on, you can only use one machine and to measure many kind of parameter. And then this impact strengths, even though they mention strengths. We, we, this is not the actual strength. This is a kind of energy. Okay, so this impact strength you can you have to use another machine called impact machine. So this is example how the impact test was applied. So the meaning of the impact is kind of you can imagine if you um, throw away your material, how how this. For example, you have cell phone. Cell phone you just throw away to the wall, and then you, you want to know this cell phone can maintain the structure or not. This is the meaning of the impact. Okay, total breakdown. So they are using this. The Charpy impact test. The standardized Charpy impact test has been designed to measure the toughness of materials under impact loading and multi-axial stress state. A pendulum impact testing machine is used to do so. The pendulum on the machine has a heavy weight at the end. This is lifted into the starting position in step one. Then the tester checks whether the testing machine has been adjusted accurately. 
In order to do this, he turns the drag indicator downwards and releases the pendulum without a test specimen. The drag indicator stops at position zero. This proves that the pendulum has the correct starting position and that the friction is correctly compensated. So basic concept of, concept of this impact test is they measure the height energy. Maybe you in the middle, high school, you can remember the height always can be changed to the yeah, height energy, location energy, they can change to the moving energy, right? Yeah, potential energy. So from this energy point of view, you can measure how much of energy they are obtained to the material. So this, so that is why they want to measure the angle. So this is the original position without any material. So they should be zero. So this, this is some um, yeah, basic. The machine is ready for the tests. First test, strain-aged plain carbon steel S235. This is our test specimen. It has been mach So for, the for this impact test, you have to make this kind of defect because we want to make the fracture only this area, not the another area. So that's why you need to make this kind of small defect intentionally. Machine to standardize size and shape with the characteristic V-shaped notch. The tester places the specimen on a support in the lower part of the machine and adjusts its position with a centering device. Next, he turns the drag indicator downwards again and checks that everything is prepared correctly. Perfect, the test can begin. The pendulum is released, it swings downwards and hits the specimen with its rounded hammer P. The specimen absorbs part of the pendulum's energy, so the pendulum doesn't reach the full height on the other side. The amount of energy that has been absorbed by the specimen can now be read off at the position of the drag indicator. It only amounts to 13 joules in this test. So, initially like zero, right? But this amount of height is decreased which means that this kind of height energy, they are absorbed to the material. So you can know how much of this height energy was decreased from the material. And then, as you can expect, more energy was absorbed, which means that more the biomaterial can resist from this kind of impact. So, so this is some sharp impact strength, and then this is another I-jolt. Difference is that how you apply the force. I-jolt, you implant material in certain area and then make the notch here, but in Sharpie, apply like this. Depending on how you apply the specimen, you can call it Sharpie and then I-jolt. But always you have to make notch, free notch. Then this is the initial potential energy, and then post potential energy, and then minus. Initial, minus, post. This is the impact strength. So even though they mentioned the strength, this is not the, not revealed as a megapascal or Newton, okay? Their value is Joule, okay? So you have to remember, this impact strength, they cannot reveal as a megapascal. They are labeled as a jewel. So this a uh, little bit complicated. Anyhow, this meaning is that how much of energy decreased during this breakdown of the material. So yeah, this is you. Once you can know this creep and batik meaning, the creep means that under below elastic limit. What is the meaning of elastic limit? Last limit below means that once you apply the force and then after applying force you release it, they their length should be go, should go to the normal length, right? This is the meaning of the elastic. But even this below the last limit, deformation can happen. This is the meaning of the creep. Okay? So let's imagine 
you have certain material in your bone or in your tooth, but always you bite the, this material with below the elastic limit. But maybe 10 years or 10 years later, you can find this material is chained in your mouth or in your body. This is the meaning of the creep. So over time, below the last limit, sometimes uh, strain can change. Their phenotype can change. This is the meaning of the creep. Okay. So similar meaning is uh, stress relaxation. Stress relaxation over time, stress changed. Right. This is the uh, creep means over time under below the last limit, strain change. And then what is the fatty view? Fatty view is significant degradation in fracture strength under cyclic load. So you imagine this is a dental implant or implant in your bone, but under uh, maximum strength, maximum strength was the meaning, the force they can make the breakdown of the material, right? But even though you apply the force below that maximum, Sometimes this material can be bro broken. So this is the meaning of the fatigue. Okay? So looks similar, but creep, they never break down. They only change their shape. But fatigue, they break down. So this is some cycle is 10 to 6 power. So uh, this material, they resist 2,000 megapascal, but uh, using this 10,000, and then when you cyclically load, maybe 10 to 6 power, they break down. Okay? So if you if we want to make the biomaterial in human body, they always pass this kind of fatigue, fatigue study. Okay. So yeah, this is a, a below the maximum load, how how much this material can maintain their structure without fracture. It's minimum fatigue. Okay, so up to this, this is some work property of the material, including surface characterization as a mechanical work property. And then maybe from the next week, I will explain the rheology. Rheology is the so how much of the viscosity has. The hydrogel. So, so when you measure certain hydrogel, you always have to consider this rheology. So rheology is a little bit uh, strange and not easy to understand, but maybe you guys can understand a little bit from this lecture. So today I will show you just briefly for anything you're understanding. So when you measure the rheology, the rheology machine they induce shear stress. So, and then when you make the distress, like this here, this is the original position, pink, but red is after applying the shear, okay? And then you can get this stress. The area, A, apply force, and then this is the meaning of the shear stress, okay? And then what is the shear strain? Shear strain, they always, they have to consider height of your hydrogen head of your material and then from this from this height how much of change of the strain okay so let's say uh, when you measure shear strain 2% which, which means that your hydrogel thickness 2 millimeter 2 pound strain change is that 2 millimeter multiply 2% so this very uh, very small change of the x axis, y axis. This is a shear strain. Okay? And then from this shear stress and shear strain, you can get the shear modulus. You divide it, the this shear stress by shear strain. This is the definition of a shear modulus. So uh, when you measure this oscillatory rheology, they always measure shear stress, shear strain and calculate shear modulus over time. And then to make this, this kind of, uh, to measure this rheology, 
we, we have this machine in our dental building. So also Mr. An is in charge of this machine. So I highly recommend you guys have to make a specimen like 12 5 millimeter of hydrogel and thickness around 2 or 3 millimeter. Okay, this is highly recommended. So actually this machine, they rotate it. They rotate. So this is our gel. And then when they approach this gel, and then this machine can automatically determine how much of this thickness. And then they start to rotate. Okay? During the rotate, you just remember this zero and then 90, 90 angle, 90 angle. But even though they rotate it, you just, just keep in mind this is another meaning of the shear stress. So when they apply like this, we can say this is a 90 angry, 90 degree change. And then at the same time, you can measure shear stress and shear strain. Okay? So this is zero, but when you shift the 90 degree, you, this machine can detect the how much of the shear stress was applied, how much of the shear strain was deformed. Okay? And then during that time, yeah, you can measure this hmm, shear strain using these things over time and shear stress all together. So basically, yeah, using this machine, uh, let's imagine you apply the shear stress, this hydrogel, but right after you apply, immediately the shear strain change without any delay, which means that this is very highly elastic material. But or most of the material, including hydrogel, they are delayed. What is the meaning of delay? So once you apply this press set shear stress, after a certain time, they start to show the change of the, their morphology. This is the meaning of the delay. So this machine can measure, uh, even though they shift 60 angle, but after a certain time, they shift 60 angle. So this is the meaning of the some viscoelastic material. So viscoelastic material is including all of your hydrogen, where your cream, your cosmetic product, all kind of things this kind of have viscoelastic material. So this is an idea. Elastic material is an example of some your uh, rubber er eraser or glass. This is a super elastic, but if you make some hydrogel or any kind of soft tissue, skin, liver, they have all viscoelastic material, viscoelastic property. So once you want to mimic the bio, uh, bio tissue, you should make this kind of viscoelastic material. So that's why biomaterial scientists, they want to know the viscoelastic property of certain material. Okay. So, so you want to know, you can measure how much of a delay happened when you apply the shear force. And then ideal, uh, ideal elastic solid material is no delay. But ideal fluid like water, 90 degree delay, which means that they never change their deformation. Because always we shift this angle 90 degree and 90 degree back. So like this and go to the initial point. That's why 90 degree means that there is no change. The, the strain is never changed. And then the meaning of the fluid is uh, the, the delayed angle is over 45 angle, which is they have more fluid material, but when they have less than 45 de delay, which means solid or gel material. So from this point of view, uh, from this uh, shear strain and stress, so during this uh, stress applied, you can measure how much of strain was occurred, and then what is the time delay, and then from this maximum stress 
and maximum strain, you can get this modulus. This is called uh, applied modulus. And then, when you consider the how much of delay, this is a sign as a G prime. This is the meaning of the elastic quotient of this applied modulus. And then G double prime means that viscose quotient. So you can divide it in two parts using this sign and then sine and co cosine, cosine, right? Yeah, cosine. Yeah. And then also they have another parameter of tangent. Okay. So today you want to remember, I, you guys have to remember this meaning of the shift angle. So this real world machine, when they shift the hydrogel, this hydrogel when they have perfect elastic material, there is no delay, and at that time you can measure. So how much of the uh, maximum stress, how much of the maximum strain as a shear modulus, and then you can get this applied modulus. But most of the material, they have viscoelastic property, so somehow they are delayed. In that case, this delayed parameter can be shown as, as this G prime and G double prime. So always this real logic machine, they show G prime and G double prime all together. Yeah, so from this part, I will tell you next week. This is too complicated for this week. Okay. Any question?